Now we'll go to Dr. Emmanuel Doy Santos. He's with us online. He's uh, uh, based in Australia and he's an advisor to the Australian government and local governments uh, on political and economic matters. Dr. Santos, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, and honorable members of the committee and the Senate for this opportunity to shed light on the matter at hand. Um, next slide, please, if the slides are there. I have a slide presentation that I'll take you through. Uh, there are actually no slides. Can we ask the oh, sorry. committee secretary um, to Anyway, I have prepared some, some remarks, so whenever they can load it there, I, um, I'll just take it from wherever it starts. Um, so good morning to you all. Um, the 1987 Constitution, uh, it, some general remarks first, Mr. Chair. The 1987 Constitution is only the latest in a long line since 1935 to contain restrictions to foreign ownership and its provisions. But the origins of these restrictions even predate that. The 1899 Malolos Constitution did not contain any restrictions to foreign participation in our economy. Ironically, by a strange twist of fate, it was the US annexation of the Philippines that caused these restrictions on foreign ownership to be inserted in the Philippine Organic Act of 1902. By the way, I have to state at the start that I am here in my private capacity and my opinions are mine alone, do not represent that of my employer. Thank you. Um, so as a concession to the Democratic House members from the South in the US, fearful that cheaper goods, especially sugar from the Philippines would flood US markets, American citizens and corporations were prevented from holding vast tracts of land engaging in mining, banking, and utility franchises in the Philippine Organic Act. The U.S. colonial government then sought to appease the Filipino revolutionaries by offering them land through land reform under Governor Taft. However, the Treaty of Paris required the U.S. to compensate the Spanish friars for these lands that the Katiponeros had occupied during the revolution. This made the cost of owning uh, productive assets unaffordable for most beneficiaries because the U.S. Treasury made them pay for these costs. This is from a paper by Aaron Marr, because you can't see the slides yet, um, published by the Harvard Business School in 2008. As a result, Mr. Chair, land ownership became concentrated in a wealthy class of local principales, more concentrated among the top quartile compared to the Spanish era, meaning to say Land ownership became even more concentrated perversely under the U.S. attempt to engage in land reform between 1903 and 1918. From economic concentration of assets, Mr. Chair, to political consolidation of power in 1910, when the first elections of the Philippine Assembly took place, a new professor, uh, Paul Hutchcroft, noted that local elites gained national prominence from where they awarded franchises. And then in the 1935 Commonwealth Constitution, this was cemented through the 60-40 rule. What started as a strange quirk caused by U.S. domestic politics in 1902 led to a permanent fixture of increased protectionism. The only exception to this rule was granted to U.S. citizens and corporations after World War II, which was the condition set for granting our independence. Now, although Mr. Chair, uh, it was considered a stain on our national sovereignty. The parity rights granted to U.S. investors actually led to rapid growth in the 1950s, the highest rate of growth that the Philippines has experienced post-war. Through trade and monetary policies that bias the importation of capital. Uh, sorry. Sorry. That's okay. I just got a message from the Secretariat. That's okay if there's no slides. Um, bias the importation of capital, intermediary goods for production over consumer goods. Um, Hutchcroft notes that manufacturing expanded by double digits during much of the decade and the value add by industry also increased. Under President Magsay Saith, the Philippines privatized many of the state-owned enterprises set up in the aftermath of the war. After Magsaysay's untimely death, the Filipino first policy gave preferential treatment to locals in using import quotas. The result was that local businesses misused these quotas to import finished goods rather than capital goods, and so the consumer bias that was spoken of earlier began. The system was gamed and corruption ensued 
leading to weaker growth, triggering a foreign currency crunch, which devalued the peso and led to slower growth in the 1960s compared to the 50s. This was the first boom-bust cycle, which halted that our transition to a modern economy as agro um, exporters uh, uh, earned a windfall from the weaker currency, even as industrial, even as the industrial sector faltered. This led to social unrest and public clamor, which led to the 19, the convening of the 71 CONCON, of which my father was a member, where more restrictions on foreign direct investments were introduced. Um, this demonstrated that we had not learned the lessons from the de debacle of the first Filipino policy. I'm on slide 10, by the way, for the Secretariat's information. Also, the US parity rights enacted in 1946 lapsed by 1974, so there were no more restraints on the nationalist agenda. Slide 11, please. In the 70s, the state took the lead in industrialization through sequestration and nationalization, relying on public debt to finance it. Slide 11. Oh, are we, are we there? Yes. Lead, leading to, to uh, relying on debt to finances, this created a bubble that became unsustainable. And the change in regulation led to a precipitous fall of FDI in the late 70s and contributed to the economic collapse in the 80s and tepid growth in the 90s. We missed the first wave of Japanese FDI, which flowed instead to our ASEAN neighbors. UP School of Economics professor Noel de Jos attributes this to the perfect storm of our economic malaise, becoming the perennial sick man of Asia. Slide 12, please. Mr. Chair, contributing to this malaise, the sectors subjected to foreign restrictions were expanded further in the 87 constitution. Next slide, please. This led Dr. Overholt of Stanford to comment that regardless of which regime was in place, the Philippines constra was constrained by an unho unholy alliance, quote unquote, of un entrenched interests both from the left and the right. Next slide, please. Mr. Chair, the World Bank noted that foreign ownerships correlated with labor productivity and might I add higher wages. This is not only due to foreign capital, but transfer of know-how. Harvard professor Hausman, Ricardo Hausman, who I know you're familiar with, Mr. Chair, says that unlike tangible intellectual property, which can be codified or easily acquired, tacit knowledge is stored in the brain and not easily transferred. It is easier to transfer this kind of know-how by moving the brain itself, i.e. the person, and therefore to Christ greater openness on our part to foreign participation in our economy for diffusion to, uh, of innovation to take place. As you can see, foreign share of, the share of foreign ownership of firms in our country remains small. Next slide, please. The World Bank further notes that um, the economic concentration in the Philippines is higher compared to our neighbors, particularly in manufacturing, despite the 100% FDI being permitted there. Does it have anything to do with the fact that our energy uh, is a key driver of the manufacturer's costs and that the 6040 until very recently remained in place and remains in place for transmission and distribution? Next slide, please. Mr. Chair, the Philippines is rated highly restrictive to FDI by the o uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. If you drop down into the weeds of their scoring system, you will find that it is due to the provisions in our charter mainly, which do not appear elsewhere, as you have already alluded to, Mr. Chair. I, can, I have provided the subcommittee with a spreadsheet on which these scores were based for its information. Next slide, please. We continue to see the results of this restrictiveness in our inability to attract foreign direct investment. The Philippines is unique in our region, comprised of former colonies, Australia and New Zealand included, or occupied countries such as Japan and Korea, for having these restrictions hard-coded in our constitution. Next slide, please. As a result, we've been overtaken by our ASEAN neighbors. Um, uh, next slide, please. As a result, we have been overtaken by our ASEAN neighbors. Vietnam, next slide, please, being the latest to overtake us. Next slide, please. In the 90, in 1985, we had three times their per capita income in Vietnam, but due to their opening up through the Doi Moi reforms of 86, while we were increasing the restrictions in our 87 constitution, Vietnam has over, finally overtaken us 35 years later in per capita GDP and minimum wages, may I add. Next slide, please. So turning to RBH 6, which considers granting legislative fiat to regulate the ownership of public services, basic education and advertising, we might ask, why is it needed, Mr. Chair? As you have, as some members of the committee have asked already. Evidently, the PSA has not necessarily solved the problem. 
After removing electricity generation from the 6040 rule through PSA, which is still subject to court uh, deliberations, renewable energy is considered one of our bright spots for investment. The problem is that our electricity grid and the lack of connectivity for commercial solar and wind power projects, which are in remote places, but closer to the consumers. Distribution is still subject to 6040. As renewable energy increases its penetration in our energy mix, the upgrade of the grid is needed to handle variable energy, or else we will risk short-circuiting and blackouts as per what happened in Panay earlier this year. Existing legislation tries to manage this, but causes slower take-up of rooftop solar due to the higher associated costs. Ari Pesco, director of the Electricity Law Initiative at Harvard Univers Harvard Law School, talks of a utility transmission syndicate in the United States, which prevents the, the integration of solar and wind and battery. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has said, he said, has tried numerous times to expand transmission capacity to, to capture new clean energy sources. This decades-long effort has been nearly an impossible task, he says, transforming a system of utility monopoly fiefdoms, Mr. Chair, into competitive marketplace. As Ari put it, what the FERC is trying to do is counteract the incentives and abilities of utilities to act uncompetitively. The problem is utility control and utility interest in maintaining the status quo. Utilities, he says, for the most part, inherently aren't against clean energy, but they deploy it at the place and scale that will benefit them. So Mr. Chair, that is one argument that I would like to put forward. I have other slides, but I will leave it at that as I believe that I have already um, exceeded my time at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Thank you very members. much. Uh, we appreciate the historical perspective, uh, Dr. Santos. Dr. Doy Santos has been raising his hand for quite some time. With your permission, we'll just uh, ask him if he wants to contribute might be on the subject matter at hand. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Santos. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Senators. So in response to the Honorable uh, Madam Senator's question, um, the emerging I would like to share the emerging practices now um, so the, uh, from my state where I'm based now in South Australia, where the power prices used to be the most expensive in the nation, it has now gone to the cheapest. And a lot of that has gotten to do with the fact that we made a transition into renewables earlier. And um, at one point there was even a major blackout because the grid connection to Victoria was cut during a power out during a storm. And then Elon Musk came in and he, there was, a, there was um, an agreement to build batteries. So a hundred uh, megawatts, that's what he did in, in 90 days. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that was that battery storage is not only power generation, but it helped to stabilize the grid by providing ancillary services. And in fact, helped lower the cost because when, when you have variable generation and it, and, and it varies during the day, the, the task of the grid is to maintain parity between supply and demand. So. The battery storage was thought to help in providing prevent blackouts by supplying energy. The, the utility derived from that um, 100 million um, investment was that it helped to stabilize the grid because you're talking here about microseconds rather than minutes to, to balance the, the inflow, influx. And it has resulted in that lower power. And then the other thing is that um, microgrids. So earlier it was highlighted that a lot of the investments are off the grid. So in fact, as I mentioned earlier in my um, statement that most of these projects are remote from the grid, but are actually closer to the consumer. So it can provide to households in the locality um, but then if you're going to set up a microgrid, then you're no longer engaged in power generation. You are now engaged in power distribution. So these are the emerging, and then there are these platforms, as was mentioned earlier by uh, the USEC. And then lastly, there's the ASEAN grid, where they're actually Australia, in my home state, they're producing solar commercials at a commercial scale to feed into Singapore. Under, through undersea cables via Indonesia. 
And so there is a plan by the ASEAN group of countries to connect ASEAN. So in fact, if you're talking about foreign power, that means that the power, when there is a deficit in the Philippines and there's cheaper power elsewhere, it could help meet our demand. But then you're talking that the power generators are completely foreign, right? But then, of course, there needs to be a connection. There needs to be a grid connection. And all this renewable, we are aiming for 50% renewable by 2035. If we have to wait for all those permitting and things like that, the 200 signatures or so that are needed, are we going to meet that target? Are we going to do it in a stable manner? Because flexibility is needed, but also stability. And so I submit, Mr. Chair, that the technical know-how, the capabilities, the innovation for that to be diffused, it's all being, it's all happening in the major centers of powerhouses of the world for that to diffuse to the Philippines. We need to be more open. And so if we were to just simply amend the PSA Act and include grid distribution and transfer, how thin are we going to slice that provision? Because sooner or later, EVs will come into the picture. So then are you going to include public utility vehicles? How thin are you going to keep slicing that ham until there's no longer any ham left? So it might be better, Mr. Chair, that we consider um, the proposal at hand that you have laid before the table through the RBH6. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very useful information. And uh, in a way, it makes us sad because uh, Australia is going to connect to Singapore, but uh, tayo, yung connection lang sa grid, di natin magawa <laughs> Connection of Visayas and Mindanao to the grid, di natin magawa for so many years already. That's, that's really sad, actually.